Hello everyone, welcome to part four of Mitra's IES 3D uh, crash course for UPSC prelims 2022. So today uh, we'll be covering completing our science and technology important topics and starting with environment. So uh, let's directly jump on to the session. So today what uh, we'll be dealing uh, uh, with is the first topic, COVAX. So COVAX, has been really in news in COVAX, which is formerly known as COVID-19 Vaccines Global Access Facility or COVAX is a global multilateral initiative to develop, manufacture and deploy COVID-19 vaccines on fair and equitable basis. See, it is coordinated by World Health Organization in collaboration with Vaccine Alliance, which is known as Gavi. So important keywords here, I'll be uh, focusing COVAX, Gavi, right? Where should you should focus? And the Coalition for Innovations in Epidemic Preparedness Safety. Safety. So COVAX is a part of larger mechanism called the Access to COVID-19 Tools Act Accelerator, which was launched in April 2022. Act Accelerator. So these are the things you should be very careful about and know about, right? Which I'm writing here in partnership with the European Commission. Okay, COVAX aims, so what is the objective? Now this is the objective. Aims to ensure the production and global distribution of COVID-19 vaccine. It functions as a funding mechanism that would assist in the facilitation and access to the COVID-19 vaccine by for less wealthy countries. So uh, funding mechanism to produce more vaccines so the vaccines can be provided to the low income countries or the countries which we, which cannot make or uh, excess the vaccines. So this is the major objective. In here, you can see who funds and who are the you know major beneficiaries of COVAX facility. This is all you need to focus in here. That's it. Uh, this this uh, you know will explain you this uh, diagram that United States is one of the biggest funders funding uh, for COVAX along with countries like Germany, United Kingdom, European Union, Sweden. So these are the respective countries. Topic 32 or second for the day today, we are going to talk about lithium ion battery. Many of you would have read it on regular basis uh, that lithium ion battery is catching fire in the electric scooters. Well, this is happening very regularly now. Hence, this lithium ion battery itself becomes very important for this year prelims. So firstly, what is a lithium ion battery? A lithium ion battery is a type of rechargeable battery. Okay, it's a rechargeable battery used, use an intercalated, which is intercalation is a reversible inclusion or insertion of molecule into materials with layer structure. It uses, use an intercalated lithium compound as one electrode material compared to metallic lithium used as non-rechargeable lithium battery, right? This is a structure actually. So this is what it is talking about. Battery consists of electrolyte, which allows for ionic movement and two electrodes. So this is the description. You read it because this can be asked by UPS. Applications, of course, electronic gadgets, telecommunication, aerospace, industrial application, but very important, made Favorite power source for electric and hybrid electric vehicles. When we are talking about lithium ion battery, we also need to have a comparison with the other contemporary and the battery which have been used. Lead acid batteries, sodium ion batteries also. So these are the major parameters under which they have been compared. Cost, energy density, safety, materials. Hey, this, this also becomes important because when we are reading lithium ion battery, it has become naturally imperative for us to also understand about lead acid, sodium ion, why there is a transition to lithium ion. It has its own reasons. This will show it to you. Cost, energy density, safety materials, site instability, efficiency, temperature range, and the major remarks are given here. This is all about lithium ion battery. UPSC won't ask more than what I've told you in this. The next topic we'll, which we'll be covering is Kavach. So what is Kavach? Kavach is indigenous automated train protection system. 
और ट्रेन कोलिजन अवॉइडेंस सिस्टम TCAS कवच सिस्टम ऑफ इट वाज अनाउंस दिस ईयर इन यूनियन बजट एज अ पार्ट ऑफ आत्मनिर्भर भारत इनिशिएटिव अराउंड 2000 किलोमीटर्स ऑफ रेलवे नेटवर्क इज प्लान टू बी ब्रॉट अंडर द इंडिजिनस सो इट इज इंडिजिनस वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट इंडिजिनस टू एनेबल सेफ्टी एंड कैपेसिटी ऑगमेंटेशन इन 2022 23 इट्स ओन इट इट इज इंडियाज ओन ऑटोमेटिक प्रोटेक्शन सिस्टम राइट कवच कवच इज द नेम आर्मर यस फीचर्स प्रिवेंशन ऑफ सिग्नल पासिंग एट डेंजर ऑटोमेटिक ब्रेकिंग टू प्रिवेंट स्पीडिंग ऑटो विस्लिंग वाइल अप्रोचिंग लेवल क्रॉसिंग गेट्स प्रिवेंशन ऑफ कोलिजन बिटवीन टू लोकोमीटर एस ओ एस मैसेजेस ड्यूरिंग एमरजेंसी सिचुएशन सेंट्रलाइज लाइव मॉनिटरिंग ट्रेन मूवमेंट थ्रू नेटवर्क मॉनिटर सिस्टम सो वॉट आर द प्रायोरिटीज all priorities are given this becomes very important this table for you because it will tell about features and the strategy how it will be deployed what kind of technology it uses electronic device it is set up electronic device and rfid devices installed in locomotives they connect to each other using ultra high radio frequencies to control brakes and you know so this becomes ultra high frequency radio frequency right so what are what is that range which i have been uh, talked about just you know see uh, this is how it works this diagram will make it clear for you the entire configuration how it happens here your important thing is again uh, features right what kind uh, then frequency which works technologies integration and one more thing which is very important is the standard safety integration sil 4 right so these are the things this itself entire uh, topic whatever is given is more than enough you you will understand kavach very nicely very very important topic again web 3.0 So what is the three point zero? It's an evolution. So from we've actually come from web one point zero to two point zero, and we are into already into web three point zero. Firstly, what is web three point zero? Firstly, very briefly, I'll touch web one point zero, two point zero, three point zero, and then I'll compare web two point zero and three point zero. So web one point zero is green. Uh, you know, in this green shoots of e-commerce, desktop browser, access dedicated infrastructure was available. so initially access to e-commerce and desktop browser was started uh, available in here where as web 2.0 social networks mobile you know internet or mobile first always on cloud computing cloud driven computing was started so this is the major difference of web 1.0 and web 2.0 whereas in web 3.0 artificial intelligence driven services decentralized data architecture like edge computing infrastructure right so this will we have already entered but still full realization of the potential of web 3.0 has to be done there has been saying that okay web 1.0 was tapped by us web 2.0 you know uh, other countries china and uh, europe emerged but web 3.0 is expected to be india trip you know india to take lead so that is why india is investing a lot in web 3.0 here we need to look into difference let's look into difference so that we better understand 3.0 and 2.0 definition the second generation of internet services focused on interaction right is uh, web 2.0 whereas third generation right okay the third generation focus the focus is primarily on community development in web 2.0 whereas the focus is on empowering the individual users in web 3.0 technologies like ajax javascript html5 these are the languages these are the web development languages these are the uh, languages you know javascript and ajax are the overall languages in the communication uh, or coding of softwares as well as front end and back back end Uh, web 3.0 actually technology is majorly ai machine learning and decentralized protocols types of applications in web 2.0 web applications whereas in web 3.0 smart application 
based on AI and machine learning will be used. State of data, the network owns the data with in web 2.0, whereas in web 3.0, entities have ownership over the data and its sharing and use. Features, improved interaction, introduction of web applications, whereas in web 3.0, smart web-based applications functionalities would be there. So this was all about web 2.0 and web 3.0. Here focus should be on web 3.0. It's use uh, the major initiatives, the major changes happening as compared to the evolution also should be realized. The next one is ExoMars mission. So European Space Agency is ExoMars mission. So by ESA, European Space Agency, you know, won't launch in, in September 2022 as it was discussed. Why? Of course, Russia war. Why? Because again, the cooperation of this European Space Agency's ExoMars was happening with Russia's space program Roscosmos. Right. So what is ExoMars mission, by the way? You know, it is a two-stage mission. Its first pass, uh, first mission was launched atop a Proton M rocket in six, 2016 and consisted of, uh, consisted of European trace gas orbiter and test lander called Shiar Parel. The orbiter was successful while the test lander failed during its descent to Mars. In the second part, uh, part which is being, uh, you know, will be launched shortly, uh, the second part, uh, you know, comprises a rover and surface platform. So ESA and NASA earlier had were, uh, you know, collaborators, but NASA dropped out. Primary aim of the mission again is to check if there has ever been life on Mars and also to understand the history of water on the planet. A European rover will drill the, to the subsurface of Mars to collect samples from about two meters of the depth. Main goal is to land ESA's rover at the site. Right. The payloads are given. Don't go too much into it. Majorly just uh, look at the mission, the major program. I don't think so. It may be the payload for this mission isn't too much important because yet it has to be launched yet. Whereas the payload for perseverance will become very important, right? Let's come to the next topic, India's defense imports and uh, defense acquisition procedure 2020. Now, major defense imports, India, I'm just quoting few, but there are many. Uh, India. Firstly, we need to understand that India is pushing defense indigenization. Uh, and that also is clearly seen in the DAP 2020, which is Defense Acquisition Procedure 2020, right? But that does not mean that India is not acquiring or importing uh, its defense supplies, right? Uh, the major ones right now I'm quoting, whereas there are many more which India is also importing, which I, I could not, it's not a complete list, but uh, the current ones, the ones which India have, you know, in last one years have had contract with. So India made Israel Tevor X-95 rifles. Until now, India got its Tevor X-95 rifles from Israel weapons industry. Now these guns are being made in India and are being supplied to central and state forces. India had signed a deal with France in 2016 to get 36 rifle jets. Till now, 30, 33 have been delivered. Right. Deal for a five S-400 Triumph long-range air defense system has been done with Russia, yes. One has been delivered already. The armed forces have received first batch of 70,000 rifles from Russia as a part of larger contract to manufacture AK-203 assault rifles in India. So uh, let's look at, you know, push for indigenization I was talking about. So India today is the world's third largest military spender after US China. India defense budget, $66 billion, right? This all are basic features. But what is India doing to promote indigenization, defense acquisition procedure, and other initiative focus on boosting indigenous production capabilities and reducing arms imports? Let's look at defense acquisition procedure 2020. It enables the notification of list of weapons or platforms that will be banned from import. So it gives a negative list. So these are not allowed. You know, in no Indian Army, Air Force, Navy, Coast Guard, you know, uh, CFPF or any other agency cannot import this. It will provide a list of weapons or platforms that will be banned for import. It focuses on FDI in defense manufacturing and indigenization of manufacturing prices. It also introduces several new ideas such as need to incorporate AI in platforms and systems, use of indigenous software in defense equipment, 
and uh, innovation by startups and MSMEs. Here, it's uh, you know procurement categories are important by uh, Indian indigenous right by Indian buy and make Indian by global manufacture in India and by global. They've classified it like that. Here, what I'm trying to tell you is in defense, what may be asked because in mains last year, S400 was asked. You never know, you know, every year UPSC tends to change some pattern. What I personally feel is that they can also ask about a particular weapon system, a particular, uh, you know, import on de in defense or the, whatever India is making indigenously, it can be asked. So it is just an introduction of this topic, but it is a very vast topic here. DAP 2020, read it properly, major highlights and focus on the major imports and the indigenous achievements in India's defense sector, right? The last topic for uh, science and tech, I'm going to cover the Nobel Prizes in Physiology, Physics and Chemistry 2021. In physics, uh, you know, three people, Manabe, Hasselman and Parisi, have actually won uh, the Nobel Prize, uh, showed how carbon dioxide and water vapor lead to global warming. Hasselman proved that the human activities made global temperature rise. And Parisi helped understand complex systems to which have higher randomness or disorder. Example, weather and climate. It's very briefly I'm telling you, so that it's easy to remember for prelims. Right? It is easy to remember. So 2021 Nobel Prize laureates in science, here I would talk about physiology. In physiology, uh, you know, to J David Julius said, the names might not be that important. Physics, chemistry, you know, here the phenomenon are more important. For example, here it is shown that, okay, climate change and global warming, their uh, physics, it is important. But as of now, you know, particular, uh, you know, high randomness or disorder, but you just need to remember in physics, what was the major, you know, field of study where this happened. Physiology will become important because for discovering mechanisms through which body senses hot or cold touch and changes in pressure. Working independently, they identified specific molecules that sense temperature or pressure changes. Now, because of this possible therapeutic uses in a wide range of diseases and in pain relief has, can be found. So the application of what research they've done, all spheres, three things, uh, you know, physics, physiology, and chemistry. This is more important, right? In any other exam, names can be asked, but in UPSC civil services, uh, PT 2022 names will never be asked. So don't focus on names. Focus on the field of study where they got Nobel, applications of that field of study in future. Chemistry discovered a new set of organic catalysts that are cheaper and greener that, than the existing metal-based or enzyme-based catalyst. Catalysts are substantial. So they actually catalysts and its possibilities in pharmaceutical sector. How? This is your focus, right? So this is about uh, Nobel Prizes. Now we come to environment. 37 topics we've covered for science and tech. And there's a high possibility, I assure you, around three to five topics will be surely, you know, touched in questions related to science and technology. I, I can guarantee you that. Let's talk about environment. And first of all, Minamata Convention. So the Minamata Convention on Mercury is a global treaty to protect human health and environment from the adverse effects of mercury and its compound. So what is Minamata? It is an international agreement that aims to protect people and the environment from mercury. That is what we've read, right? Working to phase out thermometers and blood pressure devices that contain mercury. It promotes oral health and reduce dental amalgam issue. Yeah. Implement strategies to protect small scale gold miners and other vulnerable groups and monitor mercury exposure and provide health advice. So it was agreed at the, so this is not important where it was agreed. Important is controlling the anthropogenic releases of mercury through its life cycle is one of the key obligations, right? Convention also addresses interim storage of mercury. This is also important. Convention cover all aspects of life cycle of mercury, controlling and reducing mercury. Whereas mercury mining cell play a tell emissions of mercury from industrial facilities. So mercury mining, manufacture and trade of mercury, 
and products containing mercury and disposal of mercury waste as well as emissions of mercury from industrial facility. Very important here is countries that have ratified the convention are bound by international law. To put these countries, India has ratified the convention. Recently, what happened? COP4 of Minamata Convention happened. Right? COP4. So, COP4, Minamata Convention, about that. Minamata disease. Why? From Minamata disease. Let's talk about a disorder caused by methyl mercury poisoning that was first described in the inhabitants of Minamata Bay. This is where the name comes from. Minamata Bay, Japan. And resulted which this disease resulted uh, from their eating fish contaminated with mercury industrial waste. The disease is characterized by peripheral sensory loss, tremors, and both hearing and visual loss. So COP4, Minamata Convention, major features, Minamata disease, right? And any major objective, you know, uh, it's in future they are looking for. So those, all those four objectives are important. So the next one, which we'll be talking about right now is Kigali Amendment. So Kigali Amendment, uh, a big, you know, it becomes extremely important this year. Why? Because of this reason. Cabinet approved ratification of Kigali Amendment to the Montreal Protocol. Here it is important is Kigali Amendment to the Montreal Protocol. I'll come to uh, Montreal Protocol, but I'll look at Kigali Amendment first. So... Under this, you know, when cabinet approved the national strategy for phase down of HFCs, hydrofluorocarbons, which is a what? Ozone depleting substance, HFC, will be developed by 2023. Okay. I'm, uh, so it's not a ozone depleting substance. I'll come to this, Kigali Amendment. Uh, hydrofluorocarbon, why? It is actually a very powerful greenhouse gas. Okay. Amendments to existing legislation framework to ensure compliance with the Kigali Amendment will be done by mid-2024. Under this, India will lead to phase down the HFCs by, you know, with a planned way. Benefits, it will prevent the greenhouse gas emissions thus helping prevent climate change. Now, which are the greenhouse gases? Chlorofluorocarbons, we have hydrochlorofluorocarbons, whereas HFC is a very big, uh, huge greenhouse gas will lead to employment generation and all. So this is why it becomes a very important Kigali Amendment, uh, Montreal Protocol, CFCs, HCFCs, and HFCs. Now, under Kigali Amendment, deal is to curb use of hydrofluorocarbons. Why it, it was needed? Hydrofluorocarbons, climate-damaging refrigerant, are used in air conditioning, refrigeration, foams, and aerosols as a replacement for many ozone-depleting substances. Ozone depleting substances are being phased out under Montreal Montreal Protocol, right? Phasing out of ozone depleting substances is important to protect stratospheric ozone. Very important, stratospheric ozone. Now, stratospheric ozone layers filters out harmful UV radiation, which is associated, associated with increased prevalence of skin cancer, right? HFC is not ODS. ODS. Again, Hydrofluorocarbon is not an ozone depleting substance, but it is a global warming potential is thousand times that of CO2. So the global community wanted to use HFCs also to be curbed under Montreal Protocol. Agreement in Kigali is meant to amend the Montreal Protocol to bring the HFC phase down with its ambit. Now what has been agreed? Agreement to amendment to include HFCs phase down under uh, Montreal Protocol uh, it is entered into force in January 1, 2019, creates three categories of countries with different schedules and timetables for reduction. Developed countries led by US, Japan, West European nations, developing like China, South Africa, Brazil, developing countries like India, Iran, Iraq, Pakistan. Now, phase down under for category three, which is under India, 2024 to 2026, uh, baseline 20, freezing 2028 and maximum percent rate reduction 85% by 2047. Freezing year is the year when use of HFCs will peak before being rapidly scaled down and finally phased out. Baseline years are the years for which the average production consumption quantity of HFCs is taken as an upper limit. So it is very self-explanatory. Kigali amendment end to end. From, if you read this, everything is self-explanatory and read it thoroughly, every single thing. And this topic is very important for this year prelims. The final topic for the day today, we'll talk about Keto Adjustment and Montreal Protocol. Montreal Protocol, more or less, we covered it, but 
we'll first look at what is quito adjustment in 2018 the quito adjustment is the adjustment made to the montreal protocol again it's an adjustment to protocol uh, montreal protocol kigali amendment is also what amendment to montreal protocol so everything both are related to quito adjustment kigali amendment are related to montreal protocol it aims to avoid 1 degree centigrade of future warming okay in this decision to strengthen enforcement mechanisms of this accord in response to an unexpected rise of global emissions of banned chemical trichlorofluoromethane or cfc 11 here this cfc 11 quito adjustment cfc sorry cfc 11 remember this chloro trichlorofluoromethane practical arrangements were made to implement the kikali amendment by approving technologies for destruction of substances controlled under the protocol and adopting a new data reporting requirement basically this is all you need to know about quito adjustment whereas montreal protocol again uh, it's a protocol on substances that deplete ozone layer it is a global agreement to protect earth's ozone layer by phasing out chemicals that depleted this phase out plan includes both the production and consumption right of ozone depleting substances agreement was signed in 87 1987 and entered into force in 1980 By 1985, uh, 85 due to scientific advancements, ozone depletion and its impact on human health and environment became evident. It was that uh, that the Vienna Convention for the Protection of Ozone Layer was created. So Montreal Protocol is the direct result of the Vienna Convention for the Protection of Ozone Layer. Remember this. Here, this is important. Vienna Convention was the first convention of any kind to be signed by every country involved. taking effect in 1980 and reaching a universal ratification it's a only treaty which has a universal ratification remember the vienna convention montreal protocol is signed by 197 countries it is the first treaty in the history of united nations to achieve universal ratification it is also considered by many experts as the most successful environmental global action montreal protocol uh, regulates the production and consumption of nearly 100 man made chemicals refer to as ozone depleting substances when released to atmosphere these chemicals damage stratospheric ozone only okay common but differentiated responsibilities as also there under montreal protocol that means the responsibility are common but differentiated with respect to the type of countries progress for example development developed countries will have much stiff targets as compared to developing countries so the montreal uh, protocol faces down the consumption and production of different ozone depleting substances in a step wise manner with different time tables for developed and developing countries so this was all for, for today's session we've covered 40 topics and uh, i'll be coming up with the next 10 topics uh, in the next video thank you again for uh, listening uh, and uh, to this uh, lecture i'll be coming up with the next topic so all the best to you for preparing for prelims keep working hard and let's continue with our preparation thank you so much